This week on The Review, Al Jazeera talks to the ringleader of the Cuban Five spy network after 16 years in U.S. prisons. We hear what you've had to say about a special two-part program on the Greek financial crisis. And take a look at how our news teams have been covering the Pope in Central America and events in South Sudan. Hello and welcome to The Review, the show that goes behind the scenes at Al Jazeera but also lets you do the talking. The recent U.S.-Cuba diplomatic thaw has made major headlines around the globe and of course here at Al Jazeera too. What isn't as well known is that the renewal of ties between the two countries follows two years of secret negotiations which hinged in part on a prisoner swap. One of the characters at the heart of that deal was Gerardo Hernandez, leader of the Cuban Five spy ring. Gerardo served 16 years of his two life terms in an American jail until he was finally released and returned to Cuban soil on December 17th last year. Our Latin America editor Lucia Newman traveled to Havana for a groundbreaking face-to-face -face conversation with Gerardo, which aired on our flagship interview show Talk to Al Jazeera. We caught up with Lucia via Skype. Hi Lucia, thanks for joining the review. What did you most want to ask Gerardo? I just wanted to know what it felt like to be free for someone who, for all intents and purposes, was going to rot in a U.S. prison. I mean, there was no way that he could have thought that he would be ever freed. There was no way that I ever thought he would or that most Cubans thought he would. And then suddenly from one day to the next, be home. I mean, it must have, it's, it's just something I wanted to know what that felt like. What was your experience like interviewing him? What was the most poignant part of that interview? What would really struck me about Gerardo was just how together he seemed to be for someone who had been through all this. I guess anybody who's, people who are trained to be intelligence officers like James Bond, they, they have some kind of a, uh, a different chip. He was very, very uh, strong, but at the same time, very easy to talk to. When I asked him, if it had been worth it, he seemed very taken aback. And he had to think about it. And I was stunned by his response. And I think he himself was a little bit stunned by his own response because he acknowledged how much he had suffered, his family had suffered, but he said that if he had to do it over again, he would have. And that surprised me. What did you want this important interview to convey to our Al Jazeera audience? I thought it was, the story was an amazing story for, for me. It was a love story, a spy story. It was like something out of a film, but it was very real. And so I wanted to convey how extraordinary events in individuals' lives could have even a more extraordinary impact on a much larger level. How the, the story of these two people and their baby could help to change history something surprising, something they could never have expected, and certainly something our audience would never have suspected. You know, Gerardo had clearly become a very popular figure after his release, and he's a person that a lot of journalists would be really eager to speak to. So how did you land this interview? Well, first, he has not given that many interviews. He's very picky about who he gives interviews to. And I was allowed, or he agreed, despite his wife's <laughs> reservations, I think, he agreed to give me the interview because I had interviewed President Fidel Castro one month after their arrest when the government had not yet recognized or acknowledged that they were working as spies for Havana. And in that interview, for the first time, I asked Fidel Castro about the arrest of the, uh, the Cuban intelligence officers, and he acknowledged it for the first time. He said that they were patriots and that they were not spying on the U.S. government. They were spying on uh, exile groups that were trying to undermine his country, and, uh, and he spoke very highly of them. And he told me that he was in solitary confinement at the time. And another prisoner had said as he was going by, being released, I guess, hey, Gerardo, your government has finally acknowledged you. And then they slipped a little clipping from a newspaper, the Miami Herald, where it said, in an interview with Lucia Newman, Fidel Castro said, and he said he, that changed his life. Uh, he f realized that he was not alone. And that's why he agreed to give me the interview. Thanks, Lucia. That thaw in U.S.-Cuba relations will no doubt continue to make the news up to and beyond July 20th, when both countries are set to reopen embassies in each other's capitals. But away from Cuba, we've also been covering many other stories from across the globe. Here's a quick look back over the last week's highlights.
Nurto Hassan had serious reactions to medicines given to her by doctors at the hospital near her home in Mogadishu. She now says she will never go to hospitals in this city. The medicine they gave me nearly killed me. It turned my body into blisters and white marks. I can't feel anything, even if I stepped on fire. Doctors here say thousands of patients are given fake or expired medicines every year in Somalia. Announcing the emergency measures to the nation, the president said Tunisia is now in a state of war. Islamic State carries the black flag and wants to establish a caliphate. Tunisia deserves international support. There is no country in our region or in Europe that is immune from terrorism today. The sudden declaration of a state of emergency announced by the Tunisian president comes more than a week after the beach massacre, the resort of Sousse. Outside Parliament, they cheered the result. Greece has said no to its international creditors in a sensational act of national defiance. We are Greek, we feel proud. People have been lining the streets of Quito now for hours, hoping to get a glimpse of the Pope as he goes by in his Pope Mobile. The Pope is coming to three of the four poorest countries in South America, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay. This is in keeping with his determination to give priority to those who are often considered on the periphery. These are South Sudan's rebel fighters, the Sudan People's Liberation Army in opposition. They've just come from the trenches in the eastern state of Jongle. The fighters are tired but upbeat. They sing songs of battle and victory. They've been fighting forces from the government in Juba for about 18 months now and say their mission is to change the leadership. Despite last-minute talks to try to reach a deal, there was no deal. It was supposed to be a day to commemorate the victims. Instead, it became an ugly fight over language, reflecting once again the deep divisions within the UN Security Council over what occurred at Srebrenica. A UK-sponsored resolution calling the 1995 killing of thousands of Muslims an act of genocide was rejected by Russia, using the veto granted to permanent members of the council. Four million and counting, refugees in Jordan's Zaatari camp didn't think the conflict in Syria would last this long or force this many people out of their country. Thaer al hoshan is one of the camp's oldest residents. He says two and a half years later, he's finally adjusted to life as a refugee, but had this reaction when we told him the number of refugees in the region had reached four million. This is a disaster. It means the entire population will eventually be displaced. This makes me feel that our conflict will drag on for years and then a return to Syria as soon as impossible. Now, away from the news, there were a number of Al Jazeera programs that engaged and inspired you this week. Agora is the title of a remarkable two-part film that examines the devastating impact of Greece's debt crisis on ordinary citizens and the challenges posed to the country's democracy. Mir Pelletier said the following about Agora. This is one of the most powerful documentaries I've seen so far about the situation. It brought me to tears several times. Elsewhere, our Asian Affairs series, 101 East, went to Antarctica this week for an episode called Southern Exposure, in which they met members of the extraordinary international community who live and work in the deep freeze, pursuing scientific research into climate change. And lastly, Al Jazeera launched its first web-only miniseries called My Sister Lakshmi, which follows 12-year-old orphan Marapa in his quest to find the sister he lost on the streets of Bangalore years before. Within 48 hours of its release, the first two of five short films had received nearly half a million views, and the numbers kept growing throughout the week. Sadia Jadun thanked Al Jazeera for bringing awareness to these faceless and voiceless children. And Christopher Arash said he'll stay tuned until the last installation to see what happens. Here are highlights from all three of those programs. I'm 
ಹಾಗೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿದಾಗ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಈಸಿ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇತ್ತು ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ದಿವಸ ಆದ್ಮೇಲೆ ನನ್ನ ತಂಗಿ ಕಾಣಿಸ್ತಾ ಇರಲಿಲ್ಲ ನನಗೆ ಇವಾಗ ಹೆಂಗಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಎಲ್ಲಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಒಂದು ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ನನಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿನ ನಾನು ಮಿಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊತ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ತುಂಬ ಫೀಲಿಂಗ್ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಇವಾಗ ನಮ್ಮ ತಂಗಿ ನೋಡಬೇಕಂತ ತುಂಬ ಆಸೆ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗಿದೆ ಒಂದು ವರ್ಷ ಆಯಿತು ಆದರೆ ಅವಳು ಎಲ್ಲಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಏನು ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾಳೆ ಒಂದೂ ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಇಲ್ಲೇ ಮುಂಚೆ ಒಂದು ಒಂದು ಕುಟುಂಬ ಇತ್ತಲ್ಲ ನೀವು ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಇದ್ದಿರುವಾ ಸೇಮಾ ಯಾರು ಇವರು ಪಾಗೋ ಸಾನ್ ಪೆರಾಸ್ತಿಕಿ ಕೆ ಮಿಕ್ರೋಪೋಲಿತೆ ಸ್ಟೋ ಆಕೂಸ್ಮಾ ತು ಪಿರವೋಲಿಸ್ಮೂ ಲಿಗೋ ಪ್ರಿಂತಿ ಸೆ ನೇ ಅತೋ ಪ್ರೋಯಿ ಸ್ಟೋ ಕೆ ಅಂದ್ರೋ ತಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೋತೇವುಸಸ್ ಸ್ಟೋ ಸಿಂದಗ್ಮ Ο ηλικιωμένο άνδρα στεκόταν σε παρτέρι κοντά στο κέντρο τη πλατεία και πώ περιγράφουν αυτό που τι μάρτυρε, καλύφθηκε πίσω από ένα χοντρό κορμό δέντρου, ακούμπησε το πιστόλι στον κρόταφό του και αυτό πυροβολήθηκε. The occupation government literally annihilated my chances for survival that relied on a decent pension for which I alone paid for 35 years with no help from the state. Since my advanced age does not allow me to react dynamically, although I consider taking up a Kalashnikov, I see no other solution than this dignified end, so I don't find myself fishing through garbage for food. At the bottom of the world, an extraordinary international community of scientists live and work together in Antarctica's brutal landscape. This is Frontier Science, wrestling wildlife and battling extreme weather to explore some of the big climate change questions facing the world. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we get a rare glimpse into the lives of the people living in the world's biggest, toughest laboratory. In the far north of Antarctica is one of the strangest places on the planet. It was once thought humans couldn't survive here. Now there's a town with a school and a post office. People from every corner of the world thrive in a place that's beyond extreme. It's called King George Island. Every summer, hundreds of scientists fly from the far south of Chile to the island's gravel runway. It's just a two-hour flight once you're airborne, though Antarctic weather can delay planes for days. The journey is safe enough, though you land next to a transport plane that crashed on takeoff. On behalf of our staff, our captain and this entire crew, I want to say goodbye and we hope you had a your flight today. Before we go, we'd like to take a dive deep down under to Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Correspondent Andrew Thomas's report on the crown of thorns starfish and the threat it poses to coral reefs has received more than 30,000 views. Ariel Davalos was among many viewers who appreciated the environmental coverage, saying, thanks for posting info on environmental awareness. Here's some footage from under the sea. 
When you're diving on it, most threats to Australia's Great Barrier Reef aren't that obvious. Although half of it has disappeared over the last 30 years, choose your spot carefully and there are still bright corals and plenty of fish. You don't notice the subtle change in water temperature due to climate change. And the coal ports being built along the reef's closest coast are, from here, far out of sight. But one threat, once pointed out, is all too obvious – the spiky crown of thorns starfish. There is a plague of them down here. They feed on coral and can be toxic to fish. That's it for this week. Please be sure to pay a visit to our website and Facebook page where you can leave us comments and questions about Al Jazeera's coverage. And remember, when you do write in, let us know what's on your mind. Then there's a good chance that you too can be on the review.